Welcome to The Lawyer's Podcast, a series of conversations about law practice. Each week, we talk with legal entrepreneurs and innovators about building a successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. And now, here are your hosts. Hi, I'm Sam Glover. And I'm Stephanie Everett. And this is episode 256 of the Lawyers Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. Today, we're talking with Nathan Hightower about hiring and getting the most value from your team with the Culture Index. If today's podcast resonates with you and you haven't read the Small Firm Roadmap yet, you can get the first chapter right now for free at lawyers.com slash book. Today's podcast, the last podcast of 2019, is brought to you by Earth Class Mail, SaneBox, Alert Communications, and Ross Intelligence. We wouldn't be able to do this show without their support, and we're going to keep doing it next year. So please stay tuned, and we'll tell you more about our sponsors later on. So, Stephanie, today is going to be a special episode of Hey Aaron, What Are You Reading? with you as our special guest. Yay. I guess it's, hey, Stephanie, what are you reading? Yes. <laughs> what have you I mean, been we, reading? We could ask Aaron what he's reading, but that probably wouldn't be very <laughs> interesting. Good shout. <laughs> yes. So it is the end of the year, beginning of the year, and I love doing planning and I relish my brand new written planner and I do some, you know, I do all my mind mapping for the year. So I picked up Brendan Bouchard's High Performance Habits again. So it's something I've read before but I'm coming back to it. I don't know how many of our listeners love rereading books, but I do because I always get something new the next time around. And this book, High Performance Habits, he packs in tons of examples and action items. Like he's like, here's how high performers really live their day or do their things. And here's their routine and here's what they focus on. And and I love that. So it's just kind of, it feels like a good New Year's book. Sometimes books like that are the kind of books where you bring new things back to it each time. Like I've made a point of rereading Getting Things Done a few times and I did it with Traction. I've done it with The E-Myth Revisited because, you know, you read a book, you begin to understand the concepts and employ them in your own life or in your business. And as you employ them, you learn, and then you go back to the book and you're like, oh, this all makes more sense now. I see what I need to do next. I think our book is actually going to be like that for people too. It's a little early to know if people are rereading it, but like, (laughs) I I think it is that kind of book where it gives you more, the more you take from it. Yeah, I hope so. And Traction, our book, there's a couple of others for me, Simple Numbers by Greg Crabtree that stay on my desk at all times because it's their reference books for me. And I'll come back to certain chapters. Maybe I don't reread the whole book or I'll be on the call with a labster and they'll ask me a question. I'll be like, yep, I know where that is right here, you know, and I can give them a reference point. So I hope we wrote our book that way, thinking that you could come back to it if you needed to. Mm -hmm. What else? So I just finished a non-business book, which may be interesting because I'm in a book club and we read Learning to Walk in the Dark by Barbara Brown Taylor. So not a business book, but it was very interesting because she talks about light and dark and how sometimes you need to learn to love the dark. Like we tend to talk about the dark as a bad thing. And so she even had me questioning, like, do I need the lights on it at night or do I need as many lights out in the yard? It was interesting <laughs> just to, very cool. to think about. Huh. Yeah. So by the way, Sam, what are you reading? Well, uh, the book of business, the, <laughs> the pile of business books that Aaron makes on my desk is not very large yet. So he hasn't had a chance to go through and clarify which ones I actually should read. So I actually haven't been reading many business books. I just finished Homo Deus, which is the sequel to Sapiens, which is sort of a short history of the human race and a prediction of where we're going next. I I thought Homo Deus was not nearly as good as Sapiens, for what it's worth, for people who might be wondering whether to pick it up. I read Writing My Wrongs by Shaka Senghor. Uh, Shaka was a a really powerful speaker at the Clio Cloud Conference, and they gave, I guess, maybe because we were media partners or whatever, but they dropped a copy of his book on it, and I plowed through it. It was so good, and so did my wife. You know, Shaka Senghor, he's a murderer, and he did time, and... His book is sort of wrestling with his side of that, like how to make sense of it and how to move on with your life. It was really powerful. And I think he really challenges people by not presenting, you know, you you want somebody who's committed a heinous crime to just be sorry for about it all the time. And he's like, you know, that's there, but that's not what this is about. And I think it's challenging mm-hmm. to read a book by him 
where he isn't just groveling for your forgiveness the entire time, which is kind of what you want from somebody who's done something bad. It's challenging and good. And it's a really, it's a good read, actually. It's just a, it's a good story. Cool. He was super cool to meet. Yeah. So I want to read that now. Yeah, he's, he's cool. I'm listening to the Mythos audiobook by Stephen Fry. I'm a huge Greek mythology nerd. And this is one where I recommend getting the audiobook, not the book, because Stephen Fry reads it and he's so fun to listen to. And for my fellow sci-fi nerds, I'm into the third book, Abaddon's Gate from the Expanse series, which is like a cross between Game of Thrones and Battlestar Galactica in a book. And it's so good. It's like the West Wing in the sky or something. And it's really cool. So wow. what does your pile of books to read next look like? Yeah, I think Aaron started giving me the pile instead of you because <laughs> I was just in <laughs> Minneapolis. Was, and I could get better results that way. <laughs> I don't know, but I came home with some books. So at his suggestion and request, I'm going to read Exponential Organizations. Oh, right. He took that off my pile and gave it to you. Yeah, why new organizations are 10 times better, faster and cheaper than yours and what to do about it. That sounds intriguing. I like it. I like that because it feels like it's our whole thing is trying to get more done with fewer people and resources at Lawyerist. And I know a lot of the firms that you work with in lab that we connect with are trying to do similar things. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you guys think about that. Yeah. And then at the airport, I picked up this quick little book. I don't know. It's called Quit Like a Millionaire. No gimmicks, luck or trust fund required. And I'm always thinking about money and money strategies and how to... Hmm make my money work for me. And this, the author actually was born in China and I'm like, they had zero money. Like she talks for a chapter about how poor they were <laughs> not to like, like just as she says, just so you know where I came from. And when you have this scarcity mindset, when you're, you know, that poor, suddenly like the first time when she moved to Canada and had her first Coca-Cola, she spent like, it took her 10 days to drink it because she couldn't even imagine something so luxurious. So she would only like take a little sip at a time and put but it she back. She was really disappointed when it got really flat at the end. But. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but that's about as far into the book that I'm in. But it's just kind of, you know, I like reading and just... Is it how to quit like a millionaire or a billionaire? Millionaire. So, which is fine. I'll take a million. Like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those sound good. The next book I'm going to read, the only one that I've really figured out is the next book I'm going to read is Annie Grace's This Naked Mind. And Annie Grace is also going to be on the podcast. Mm -hmm. She talks about, I don't know if people remember when uh, my cousin Jeff Glover was on the podcast to talk about addiction and dealing with it and kind of getting away from the all or nothing binary mindset of, a, you, you know, you're either an alcoholic or a drug dealer or, <laughs> or you're not. And Annie Grace takes that idea as well and works on it. And I'm currently doing her 30 day alcohol experiment and I've gone dry and it's it's an interesting program. I, I think if people are getting to where it's this thing where in the middle of winter, you know, it gets, especially in, in the northern latitudes like Minnesota, it gets dark, it gets dreary, seasonal affective disorder sets in and people start drinking more. And if you're like, oh, I think I'm just drinking too much, try the alcohol experiment. It's a good way to get coached for free through taking a break. And that's what I'm doing. And I think it'll be interesting to interview her in what will be kind of the middle of that experiment. Yeah. And if you're feeling similarly and you think, hey, maybe it'd be good for me to take a break, then by the time the podcast drops, you'll be in the middle of it too. And that'll be kind of a cool way to experience that podcast. Yeah, super cool. I'm looking forward to that. Also, the Small Farm Roadmap is now available in the audiobook we just learned. So I'm super excited to listen to it. <laughs> yeah, we, we were having our holiday party at my house the other night and I got the email saying that the audiobook had launched and happened to look down at my phone and was like, woohoo. So. And I don't know, I feel compelled to share this with, with our folks. During this process, we actually got a note back from the person who, who read it about whether we wanted it pronounced lawyer or lawyer. <laughs> that was so funny. <laughs> and we had to listen to this, to this woman saying those words. And I just remember lawyer, writing to the, yeah. <laughs> and I live in Atlanta. So that felt very natural to me, but I was like, Oh, you know, but I thought things that I would never do in my life. <laughs> like, this is a new, a new thing. Like I got to listen to, we actually got to listen to people audition for the recording. So you've never been, it was just a whole new experience for me. So I'm excited to experience the book in a I new way. I wish we had one of those voicemail inbox is set up for the podcast so that everybody could call us and just say lawyer in the way that they say it. That'd be hilarious to just get lawyer. Yeah. It'd be hilarious to get like 500 voicemail messages that just say lawyer, 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 lawyer. <laughs> it is, I know it starts, it starts sounding weird when you say it, it a totally bunch of does. times. Yeah. Um, but every, anyway, every word does. <laughs> yes. Check That's that out. Awesome. If, if, and you can find out the result of how she says it. <laughs> yeah. Probably the easiest place to get the audiobook is on audible.com which is Amazon's audiobook service. And that's for what it's worth. That's where I get most of my audiobooks. But, but yeah, check it out. It's out there now. I think it's on a few different places, but you know, that's the easy one. 
So cool. I'll try to put all of the links to all of those books in our show notes so that people can go grab them if they want and um, or just look for them on future podcasts, I guess. We've got a brief sponsored conversation now with Jess Garza from Earth Class Mail, which is a fun welcome to the podcast for a new sponsor. And then we'll have my conversation with Nathan Hightower about Culture Index, which is super cool. Hi, this is Jess Garza. I'm with Earth Class Mail. We provide virtual mailboxes, mail scanning, and forwarding services. Welcome, Jess. Thanks for being with us today. I was just doing the math in my head and realized that I took my law firm paperless 14 years ago, and yet I am still trying to persuade lawyers to go paperless. And one of the places that I know lawyers get stuck because they know they need to do it and they try to implement it and then they get stuck on how to manage all of the incoming paper. Do they put a scanner on every lawyer's or every staff person's desk? Or is someone the bottleneck that everything has to go through? Um, And then what do they do when they find themselves picking up a piece of paper and wondering whether or not it's been scanned? And it turns out that there's a really easy solution, and that's using digital mail and just making sure that everything gets scanned. So since that's what Earth Class Mail does, maybe you can give us some examples of the advantages of using digital mail. Oh, absolutely. And you hit the nail on the head. For a long period of time, lawyers, I think, have been trying to go paperless. And it's an effort that they have to sort of work towards and continue to uh, make Mm -hmm. developments in. So I would say the key three advantages of digital mail would be in in the case that you've just mentioned with scanners on every desk and and mail coming in and maybe documents coming from from various sources, um, it creates sort of this uncertainty around which documents have and have not been scanned may cause, you know, documents to be rescanned. And in other cases, and worst case scenarios, uh, documents can get lost in that sort of shuffle. So I think that one of the key advantages for lawyers is that with a digital mail solution, there really is no more question about whether something has been scanned because it's scanned immediately upon receipt. Another thing that we often hear is that lawyers are sometimes dealing with documents for which they need original copies. And if you've got a digital mail room, once the document is scanned, you're, you have that flexibility to request a, an original be sent to you. So you never really have to, to sacrifice you know, dealing with a physical document if, if you need it when you've got a digital mail room. And then the last, I would say another advantage of a digital mailroom would be, in our case anyway, we offer check depositing services. So if you are a firm that is still receiving payments via check, many are, you probably don't want to stop what you're doing and make a trip to the bank. So we enable our customers to deposit checks electronically with just a click of the button in the application. That's so cool. There's a couple concerns that I know always come up around this. You already hit one, which is what if I actually need originals? Just click the mail it to me button. Privacy, do I get this right? You're HIPAA compliant. We are. We are. And that means that, you know, there there are three key areas that we sort of have to be very diligent in. One of them is in administrative safeguards, right? We've got to have policies and procedures and ongoing training aimed at protecting personal health information, but but all types of information. People's mail is ultimately sensitive. It's pretty private, yeah. That's right. So we sort of treat everything like it's personal health information, even when it isn't. So I would say the second thing we have to keep in mind with our HIPAA compliance is, is a physical safeguard uh, program. So obviously we need to protect the actual physical document but also the process of handling information and and data. And then the third would be, you know, technical safeguards. You want to make sure that you're dealing with a digital mail solution that protects the data by controlling storage and, you know, the sharing of communications electronically. That's very cool. There's another concern I know comes up that is a bit of a red herring, as we'll as we'll discuss. But what about really urgent stuff? And what I have in mind is like, you know, I have a brief due this afternoon and the entire thing is sitting on my desk. I emailed out an affidavit I didn't realize I need until, you know, today, and I'm waiting for my client to get it back to me, and I, or maybe yesterday, and I can't file this thing, which is due today until I get it. How do you recommend that we lawyers deal with stuff that is just way more urgent and can't go through the normal process of arriving in your mailbox and then clicking the button to deliver the original and then waiting for it to arrive? It's a great question, Sam, it, it, and it does come up. I would say the way that our successful customers have, have handled that challenge, because it does come up, is they've just simply used a courier service as they might have in days prior to them having a digital mailroom. And they're very clear uh, with their vendors and their other stakeholders about which addresses they prefer specific types of mail or documents be sent to. So the digital mailroom can be used for a bulk of their documents and multimedia as well. But in some cases, things are so urgent, they should be routed directly to a physical address. Yeah, it's just pretty simple. Just please email me these kinds of things, or this is really important to email to this address. Done. Absolutely. Yeah. 
you also had a, a really interesting tip, which I hadn't thought uh, one of the other obstacles of going paperless is often I have a bunch of paper lying around my office. Am I just going to give up a week feeding documents to the scanner? And one of the things you suggest is if you have digital mail, just package it all up and mail it. That's right. Yourself. That's another advantage of having a digital <laughs> mail room. Just box it all up and send it to yourself. That's super cool. So listeners, if you'd like to learn more about creating a paperless law firm using digital solutions, you can visit earthclassmail.com slash lawyerist to get a free white paper on that and learn more about Earth Class mail, obviously, as well. Jess, thanks so much. Of course. Thanks for having me. Hi, Sam. I'm Nathan Hightower. Thanks for having me on. And uh, I am a strategic advisor with Culture Index out of Atlanta. And I am also a recovering lawyer, which is applicable (laughs) to your audience. Yeah. And so basically starting with my why, I really am passionate about what we do in promoting strategic business performance while also helping people be fulfilled in their roles. I'm not sure how relevant it is, but I'm curious. You said recovering lawyer. What did your legal background look like? Yeah. So I actually practice at uh, Brian Cave mm-hmm. for a little over 10 years and mostly in uh, real estate and large lending projects. Gotcha. Uh, representing large banks. Yeah. We're going to talk about Culture Index through the work that it does, but I'm curious what does the core customer base of Culture Index look like? Is it bigger companies? Is it medium sized companies? And, and what does that mean? Yeah, it's really all over the map, Sam. We really want to be able to be in a position to help people who want to grow. Mm-hmm. And we primarily do that by partnering, whether that's a CEO, a managing partner, or other operational business leader, to really study, interpret, and mobilize seven work-related traits for three outcomes. And that's really more revenue, more profit, and more sustainable scalability. Yeah. Let's dive in and talk about what the Culture Index is and what it measures because I think that's that's why we're here. By way of prefacing this, I reached out to you because you had introduced the concepts to Stephanie Everett a while back and she found it fascinating. And so we were just, we were chatting about it when we were in like San Diego, I think at Cleocon. And I was like, oh, I'd like to talk more about that and learn more about that. And so the first thing you did was say, I think you need to take it so that you can see what it is. Right. It was a little bit disarming because I, I was expecting like, you know, a big survey, but it's essentially two questions. Right. And maybe you could describe those, quite, you know, what it was that I was doing and the significance of it. Yeah. So we are essentially measuring, as I said, seven work related traits. Mm-hmm. And those are traits that really are ingrained in you from an early age because it doesn't do a lot of good to measure something, number one, that changes all the time. Right. And you know, scientists are even saying that you know a lot of these traits are ingrained in you even earlier, as as early as you know five six years old. So we really want to understand the thumbprint of of who somebody is on a work related context because that is what we are looking at. There are certainly applications to personal life, but we are focused on work related life. We are also looking at how that relates to who you perceive you need to be on the job to be successful. I mean, there, there's sort of like a preliminary assumption here, which is that there is a core self that is you, or, or right. at least with respect to these relevant traits. That's right. Um, yeah, that's right. And that's you're right. trying to are, uncover are, who that is. As you and I talked about before, um, sort of the, the inverse of that is, you know, we're not measuring someone's moral compass. We're not measuring faith or sex or any of those sorts of things. And nor would, would anyone want us to. Yeah. Um, because we want to get at the core of, of who somebody is so that we can really bring the, the most out of them and they can bring their whole self to work so that we can get the best ROI out of employees, but also have them be the most fulfilled. And so the test itself is, I think the first question is, you know, which of the following traits do you most strongly identify with? And it's just a, it's basically a tag cloud of words that describe personality or character. And I just select the ones that I feel like apply to me, right? It's like a 50 keyword thing or something. Yeah, it's a survey. You know, there's mm-hmm. no pass fail. Yep. It's not really a, a test per se. And it is free choice. It is, it, and it's not uh, even like a select 10. It's just like select as many as you want. Select as many or as few as you want. And uh, that in and of itself lends to the the accuracy and validity that, that we you know, achieve behind it. Is there like a critical mass if I don't select at least 10 or something? Are you, does it throw things off or? There are certainly uh, tripwires within our system that we can understand whether or not someone is trying to potentially game the system or not <laughs> okay. understand 
you know, enough of what's required. So I read your white paper on this and it addressed the idea of gaming the system, which I mean, I get as a concept, but it's interesting because the, the test is just entirely, you know, please describe yourself. What things do you identify with? And I feel like it would be kind of I guess what I would be doing to try and game the system is if I understood very well the job I was applying for or the role I was trying to move into mm -hmm. and I was predicting I could try and give it the answers I think it needs, I guess. It feels like it'd be hard to game this, though. It would be uh, because you really don't know what you are trying to answer in order to do that. Yeah. It's just it's not it doesn't lend itself to being able to do that very easily at all. And then the second question is like, do the same exercise, but from the perspective of what you think this position requires or the position you're applying for, the position you occupy. Mine's a little weird. I kind of mixed mine up around the two or three hats I wear, but kind of like what are the traits that you think are required to be successful in this role? Correct. So, yeah. you know, and, and really what that gives us a picture of is is understanding, you know, the juxtaposition of those two things is, is tantamount to engagement. It also helps us better understand what sort of stress may you be under in your current role that's that's not helping us perform and hit on all cylinders as, a, as an organization. And again, not fulfilling you. When you were kind of doing the analysis of my results, well, so first of all, that's it. It's two survey questions that are basically a cloud of words that you can click or not according to your whims, basically. Right. <laughs> and, right. And that's it. That's the entire survey. It takes like five minutes, 10 minutes. If you're reflective and indecisive, I suppose you'll check those things and it will take you longer. Right. But, but that's it. And when you were doing the analysis on me and uh, my job, and it was super interesting to talk through, but you framed it all in terms of sort of the tension between what you are doing and what you your personality, what your core self needs to be doing. And the difference between those two things is sort of a measure of you know, the misfit, but also the the stress of your role. Like it is going to be, to the extent that those aren't aligned, it's going to be wearing you out It or it's a misalignment of value where the company isn't getting the value out of you. You're either overpaid or underpaid for some or all of the work you're doing, right? That's right. I, I like to think of it kind of like a triangle of can do, want to do, and, and wired to do. Um, mm -hmm. We can all do, you know, can do a lot of things. We all may want to do I would love to be an opera singer or some kind of musician, but it's, I'm not. Right. And all the practice in the world is not going to get me there. And that's, you know, I just read a post on LinkedIn and, and commented on that just this morning of really concentrating more and more on your strengths and not, you know, relishing in your weaknesses or trying to bring something that you're a three at to a, to a six right. because it's just not worth the effort. This feels like it fits nicely within the concept that we use in the small firm scorecard or, you know, the traction EOS model of right person in the right seats. Exactly. Yeah. We highly encourage whether you're a small firm owner or a medium sized firm owner or above to really avail yourself of traction and or other models that help you be more you know, concretely focused around what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that came up for me when we were talking is like part of my job at the moment is essentially doing our company's IT because we're very small and there's nobody else to right. do it. And like, I'm perfectly capable of doing that job. Yeah. But for a number of reasons, you were pointing out that like, I'm obviously overqualified for that. And our, so our company is overpaying me for doing that. Right. And it's, there is that tension, that stress between um, one of the things that was illuminating for me is that you were like, Sam, you're kind of low on focus. And I was like, well, yeah, but I can sit and work all night on a coding project. And you were like, ah, you're good at focusing on things you want to focus on, <laughs> but but you're right. terrible at focusing on things other people want you to do. And the definition of IT is solving other people's problems that they bring to me. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, I fucking hate that. <laughs> right, <laughs> so... <laughs> right. Well, you are very much, a, as I said, a strategic problem solver. You love right. to what if. You love to think outside the box. You love to, to think about things and solve things at a higher level. Right. And so to the extent I'm not doing that, it's like it's hard. Right. Which is like, oh, yeah, duh. <laughs> right. And I can tell you're trying to dig in and live in the weeds and the minutia. Mm -hmm. And it's not that you can't. It's just should you. Right. So this feels like a good place to pause and hear from our sponsors and we come back. Let's dig into the traits a little bit and just talk about what culture index is, you know, what those traits are. What are the seven components of my productive self? So, sure. or my working self. So we'll be back in a few minutes. 
Longtime podcast listeners and lawyerist readers know that Sam and I get pretty excited about email productivity tips, but we know that most people don't have the time or energy to be email productivity nerds like us. So it's great that SameBox will take care of fixing your inbox for you. I've used SameBox for a while now, and it automatically organizes your incoming email into smart folders so you don't have to be overwhelmed by a busy inbox and don't have to see important client emails next to junky coupon offers, distracting you from the work you need to do. Best yet, SameBox learns with you, so if you find it puts something in the wrong folder, just move it, and SameBox will automatically learn your preference. It also has nifty features like Sane Black Hole, where you can drag messages from annoying senders you never want to hear from again. It's so simple, you won't need to learn anything to use it. It just takes care of everything itself. SaneBox works directly with every single email server or service that has ever been created, so it will definitely work for you. Get a free two-week trial and a $25 credit by visiting samebox.com slash lawyerist today. That's S-A-N-E-B-O-X dot com slash lawyerist. A legal-only call center, Alert Communications has been helping law firms and legal marketing agencies with new client intake for over 50 years. Alert responds to and captures all leads for your law firm efficiently using their highly trained intake specialists and software solutions. They work 24-7, 365 as an extension of your law firm in both English and Spanish. Alert strives to set best practice standards within the mass tort legal community by using ethical ideals, in turn elevating the quality of client services and earning the trust of attorneys. To find out how Alert can increase your mass tort or class action lead conversion rates, call 844-MY-INTAKE or find them at alertcommunications.com. With Ross Intelligence, lawyers conducting legal research leverage AI to get to the heart of legal issues fast. Ask a query in natural language on the Ross Legal Research Platform, and Ross will return on-point case law. Attorney Jonathan Udoka says he's able to use Ross as though it were a first-year associate doing top-flight legal research. At $89 a month, Ross is not only fast and intuitive, it's also affordable. See what Ross can do. Go to rossintelligence.com slash lawyerist today and get a 14-day free trial. Use the promo code lawyerist for 10% off your first-year subscription. Okay, we're back. So Nathan, where we left it is we'd sort of introduced the concept of culture index and what it was doing, but we skipped over what it is actually measuring. And and what you get is a chart with some letters on it and some colored dots on a range and not a lot of explanation until you meet with a you who helps interpret and analyze the results. And so maybe at a high level, we can talk about what those traits are, because I actually just think it's interesting to talk about here are the components of yourself. Sure which is basically what we're doing here. Sure. We're basically looking at a bell curve, Sam, and you know, higher on the bell curve is more pronounced in that particular trait. Lower on the bell curve is you know, less pronounced in that particular trait. Or to put it a different way, the farther away you are from the mean mm-hmm. uh, of the population, the, the more pronounced you are in any particular trait, higher or lower. It's not a good or bad. It's just how much more obvious you are than the mean for the population in any one trait. And is there a pattern where like most people strongly deviate on one or two things? No, um, it is pretty evenly balanced. Uh, You're going to have at least one high trait, if that uh, better answers your question than others, but you are not going to necessarily have... Some people may be all over the map. Other people may be right down the line. Yes, yeah, okay. that's correct. Yes. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So what are the traits? What is... I mean, the chart is there's A, B, C, D, L, and I, and then there's a little EU thing. Yeah. So just at a, at a very high level for our for our listeners here, the A, we're looking at, at autonomy, and it's really, you know, whose rules do you live by? Mm-hmm. Um, and in your case, uh, you are, I will say, in the very high category on that. If we're sort of relating that to you, it means you're much more of a, a strategic, future thinking, macro thinking um, type of an individual. My business partner is rolling his eyes at this point. He's like, oh, God, <laughs> yes. <laughs> in other words, you, that's right. You, you want to be more in control of, mm-hmm. of your environment than have it be in control of you. Yep. That's A. B is social ability, right? Yeah, social ability. And we're really trying to understand how much someone needs, wants, and seeks social acceptance. Mm-hmm. And really digging into that, you're a little bit lower on that. And what it does not mean is that you're not a friendly person or you can't talk to people, but it does mean that you're more analyzing and mm-hmm. you're more researching. That's funny when you say like, what that means is, not that I'm antisocial, but 
that there's, I mean, because one of the things that you made obvious to me as we were talking through the results is that it's not black and white, that there's, it's not like your number on this is an A. And so this is what you mean. It's it's all in context. It is in context and relates to the other traits. Right. It, it doesn't mean that you can't carry on a conversation with people. That's not what we're talking about at all. There is much deeper meaning that we could even get into here. But, you know, in your particular case, right. since you are lower there, you're, you're just more of a a skeptical researching yeah. and analyzing type of an individual. And then C is mental pace and work patience. And like, I have none. So, right. You're, you're lower. <laughs> let's just say you're lower on patience and, uh, uh, you're, you're the guy that's kind of looking down. I think I told you at the, at the GPS and it's, you know, it's just 43 minutes to your destination. And you're thinking about, you know, how can I get there in 36? Mm-hmm. And then D is uh, detail orientation and, and conformity, which I think it's interesting that those two are how you put them together. Yeah, they're they're sort of uh, two sides of the same coin in a way. But um, again, you're you're more on the left hand side of that, and this is where this is interesting. You're more of a nonconformist, meaning you know you want to do things not the way somebody just tells you to do them. Mm-hmm. Let's just put it that way. But you can be intense around conforming and doing, you know, details and and follow up and follow through that you want to do or that which accomplish kind of, which kind of relates back to my A trait, a right? That exactly. like that, that's how you get to that is you're like, okay, you're low here but you're high here and that means this. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So if we stop for just a second and tie a bow on this, because some people may be rolling their eyes a little bit at listening to individual traits, it's if mm-hmm. I wanted to get someone to come in, as we've described you, you're a strategic problem solver type person. Mm-hmm. And let's say you got a law degree, okay, which you do. All right. But we want to hire someone to just sit in the corner and work on detail all day, every day, and that's what we want them to do from now till, you know, cows come home. Go, we need to know that. What do we want out of that role? And how does that point back to our yeah, strategy? Hiring me because would, be, if, would be dumb. It would be hard. Yeah, <laughs> it would be hard uh, internally. And also, how do you relate to the, the person managing, directing, leading you? <laughs> Yeah, I'd be fighting them all the way. And again, like this is one of the things where it's not good or bad. It's just I would be a bad fit for that job, but there are other jobs that I'm a great fit for. Right. Yeah. Right. The next item on the graph is I may even just share mine so that people can see this in the show notes. But the next item is because I don't think I, there's anything in here that I would be more or less embarrassed about. But um, the next one is EU, which you you called mental battery. Say more about that. Yeah, uh, briefly, it's a, a mental battery. How long can you not be you until you need to recharge? Right. That's such an interesting way to phrase it. Yeah. And and really it's we get even more out of it by comparing it to the bottom graph, which, again, is your. Yeah. Uh, you know, who you perceive you need to be on the job to be successful. So if we're looking at those two in in comparison, I'm less concerned, at least for purposes of this conversation, about what that top number is, but how does it compare to the bottom number? The difference between that and who you need to be for the job. So like that's minor, right. minor 27 and 14, and you're like, you need to make some adjustments, Sam. That's pretty far off. Well, so, and for the listeners, not only is there a pretty large delta between the two of 13, it's also your top graph of who you are is very different Right. from the bottom. So it's taking it all in context and trying to understand what's the picture that we're seeing here. Gotcha. And then uh, L is logic. Mm-hmm. And you said that these below the line are measured slightly differently than the ones above the line, right? Yeah, the ones on the top, we're looking at them in reference to the mean line. Right, deviation uh, the, from the red arrow. average. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, and then on the bottom two, we're just looking at, you know, they're really uh, to the left, they're lower, and to the right, they're higher uh, on the scale. And uh, logic is just more of a, a filter, whether you look at things from a, more of an emotional context, you know, more charismatic view of things to more black and white mm-hmm. on that scale. So it just helps us understand kind of the filter through which you make decisions. And then I is ingenuity. Ingenuity. And that's more of a continuum of, you know, do you think about things more concretely and, and linearly to uh, are there some pretty ridiculous amorphous concept type thoughts going through your through your mind. Okay, so that gives us kind of the picture of the thing and of the culture index and what it is. And it sounds like, let's say you're using it in hiring, what you're trying to do is you have a concept of the job that you're hiring for and the job behaviors that are necessary. And so you're gonna kind of draw that bottom graph 
in collaboration with the company. And you're going to work together and figure out what the bottom graph should look like. And then applicants, you're going to ask to take the survey and you're going to compare their top graph to your bottom graph and try and figure out like how close are these two things. Is that right? Yeah, it's actually the top graph. In other words, we want to make a target out of who somebody needs to be. I see. And, okay. And I, and I want to always point somebody back to, and this is particularly relevant for, for those listening, is what is your strategy? What are you trying to accomplish? What is your North Star? Where are you going? Yeah. And then, and only then, do role planning and team design. So instead of just thinking about names and faces, start thinking about who do I need? Mm -hmm. When, what is their role? Um, what should their role be like? And then we're able to help you uh, develop a target for what that should look like. And maybe the more prominent way you use it is when companies are trying to figure out like how to unlock their their leadership or how to unlock their employees, you would do a similar exercise with people who already work for the company and then figure out if they need to change the organizational chart. Yeah, I, I would actually say a smaller percentage, relatively speaking, uh, okay. is spent on the prospective hiring side just across the board. Yeah. It's, it's really because you're going to go to war with who you've got. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got 10 people on your team or 100 people on your team or, or whatever in, in between, we're not saying or suggesting that you should just upset the apple cart tomorrow. We want you to better understand who you've got so you can get the most out of who you have. Gotcha. And as you have opportunity through growth and other, other ways to really be more intentional about that, you should. Is there a particular stage that like a firm or a law firm or, or a small company would be at when they're most likely to say, okay, now is a good time for us to do this exercise? I kind of think it depends on their growth curve. Really, what do they want to accomplish with their firm? If they're sitting at five people, but the founder really has it within them to want to grow their firm to 10 and 15 and 20 and 30 and 50 and the corresponding elements and KPIs that go along with that, then I think it's different than somebody who just wants to stay at five and they're comfortable with that. I guess I'm also wondering too, if, if like, uh, it, it sounds like traction companies are something that you also deal with. And I'm wondering too, if, you know, the concept of GWC of get it, wants it, and has the capability to do it, which feeds into the right person, right seats framework and traction that super resonates with me, but it also is, I'm not confident that we have nailed how to analyze that for people in our company. And I think it's difficult to do. And I'm wondering too, if it might just be, if sometimes people come to you sort of out of frustration, like we're trying to do this and it's not working great. Can you help us do a better job of figuring out if the right people are in the right seats? Yeah. Everyone's pain points are different, right? So a lot of times we may hear, I just need more A players or, you know, right. it, it's like a, a sports injury. My ankle hurts, but I, I don't know why, you know, I, I just, <laughs> yeah, I, no, that, that's a really good analogy. <laughs> yeah. So I, I need to figure this out. And then as we dive deeper, it's, it's really, it wasn't your ankle. It was, it was something else that was making your ankle hurt. That's interesting. I mean, I, I suppose I, I now I've alluded to it. Like culture index is a proprietary thing that your company invented and administers. So it's not, it's not the kind of thing where you can just go out and read a book and do it yourself. Implementing it wouldn't mean hiring your company. It would. We are we are strategic advisors, and I am one of. Uh, we're all over the country. I'm in Atlanta, and there are over, I believe, over 45 of us at this point in the country, and, and we're based out of Kansas City, mm -hmm. and uh, and I'm a licensee out of Atlanta, Georgia. So yeah. Although I think there's probably some interesting takeaways for everyone in the discussion that we've had about the idea of like, you may not be able to implement culture index, but just understanding this, I, I think like the concept of mental battery and the stress between a fit and a misfit are just like, for me, talking through the culture index results that we did was helpful. Yep. Although it actually kind of, it's not like we didn't know that me doing IT was a poor use of my time. It was just that we, it helped to kind of like surface it in the way that we did during our conversation. I was like, oh yeah. And like, I get, now I understand better the consequences of me doing work right. that I probably shouldn't be doing. Yep. And obviously you're going to wear many hats as an entrepreneur and, and starting up a firm or business of any kind for that matter. But as quick, Lee, as you can move beyond that and, and run in your lane, the better you're going to propel yourself forward. Well, it was one of those things that it's kind of been nagging at me. And I thought maybe you might have some insight in this, but this concept of it crops up all over the place. Like if you're in the marketing for all kinds of legal tech products, it's, you know, stop doing X and get back to what you do best. And it's this idea that if we could just do one thing that we're really good at all day, wouldn't that be great? On the other hand, I'm not so sure. Like, I think we all need some variety in our day to be interesting. And 
So I'm wondering if you had any insight into like, you know, I totally get the concept of misfit and the stress between, you know, who you are and and the job that you're being asked to do and, and the mental battery things. But I'm also wondering how realistic is this idea that we can fit you into a perfect box and then you'll be happy there. It feels like that's not quite a complete (laughs) <laughs> right, <goal. laughs> right. It's it's um you can overdo that or overanalyze that notion. Um, I recently sat mm-hmm. down and, and inter- interviewed myself, one of the one of the top level executives at Chick Fil A, and and he made the comment that the that the growing complexity of business begs for specialization. Mm-hmm. You can't just throw anybody at, at the problem anymore. The business issues are too complex, and it just does not uh, lend itself to ultimate fulfillment for the individual or purpose-driven results for the organization without doing this. I will say to caveat that and to fully answer your question, I think at least, at least, and I'm making this number up, 80% plus of your job ought to be something where you are able to, as I said, run hard and fast in your lane. Mm-hmm. There are always, there, uh, there's always going to be a component where you're having to do other things. Right. Um, one of I think Horst Schultz's latest book on uh, who who founded uh, the Ritz Carlton, you know, even alludes to this in his book of you know we are training you to be a concierge, we're training you to be um, you know a server, a, a janitor, whatever that may be, and that is your job, and we want people who are wired to do that. But if you overhear somebody who needs you know a house coat or they forgot their toothbrush or or, or whatever that is certainly you can run get that. Mm -hmm. So I think that translates to, you know, to business, to law firms, it's not adopting the, you know, it's not my job approach. But for the most part, we are trying to align you with what you are wired to do so that, you know, again, we can get the most out of you and you can actually enjoy it without feeling like you're going through life with the, with the air brakes on. Yeah. I mean, understanding that 80% was an arbitrary number that you pulled out there, it's helpful for me to to have that piece of it, which is like, we're not trying to fit perfect square, you know, pegs into perfect square holes. We're trying to, it's okay if there's a little bit of a gap there because, and, and it may even be beneficial. Yeah. We want them to both be square, but we don't want to we also don't want to use a hammer yeah. to hit an octagon and, and do a... <laughs> right. That's helpful. I think listeners probably know by now. We are sort of in the age of theories um, about everything, where every theory, every system, every book um, wraps things all nicely up. And I think it's really interesting to explore, like, how neat does that actually play out? And the goal of, like, most of the time you should be doing the work that is a best fit, but it might be beneficial or it's definitely necessary for you to do stuff outside of that is is helpful to hear yeah. along with this. So thanks for that. Yeah, sure. Any parting thoughts on Culture Index, stuff that we didn't get to that you feel like people really ought to know about it to understand it? I think, Sam, it just it really comes back to if I could help educate founders of firms or those that are more mature is just concentrate as early as you can on really sit down and understand, OK, I may be founding a law firm or I'm a few years in or, or many years in, but reorienting yourself around why am I doing this? What am I trying to accomplish? What do I want to see it do over the next 24, 36 months, 5, 10 years? And what roles do I need to accomplish that? And, and how can I path do towards that those things? Yeah. Yep. Mapping and how it can out. I do that on purpose? Yep. And map it Very out. Cool. That's right. Nathan, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed talking about Culture Index. And uh, obviously, we'll have links to show more in the show notes. And I'll figure out how to show people my uh, map as well without all the surrounding stuff, just so they can get an idea of what the results look like. Because I think it's kind of fascinating and mystifying at the same time. Great. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for having me. Are you interested in implementing the ideas you've heard on today's podcast into your law firm? Could you use a little help? Hey guys, it's Stephanie, the VP of Community Success here at Lawyers, and I'd love to help you tackle your business or take it to the next level. Head over to go.lawyerist.com backslash start to sign up for a quick call with me, and let's talk about how Lawyerist can help you create your best law firm. Make sure to catch next week's episode of The Lawyerist Podcast by subscribing to the show in your favorite podcast app. And please leave a rating to help other people find our show. You can find the notes for today's episode on lawyerist.com slash podcast. The Lawyerist Podcast is edited by Paul Fisher. The views expressed by the participants are their own and are not endorsed by Legal Talk Network. Nothing said in this podcast is legal advice for you.